Welcome to Bible class at the Greenbury Church of Christ. I really do appreciate your presence as we continue to read through the Gospel of John together and as actually we're getting closer and closer to the end of the Gospel. We're reading it under the direction of John 20, 30, and 31. So if you will, read along with me as we read together. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples which are not written in this book, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, as your glory is declared in the heavens above, we give you glory on this earth this day. We pray that what we do and who we are brings you glory. May the words of our mouths and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing in your sight and a witness to the world of your grace, truth, and the kind of life that only comes from you. Father, there are a number of people for whom we pray. Many are suffering physically. O Lord, be with them. Others are being tested spiritually. O Lord, be with them. Some need your comfort and encouragement. O oh Lord, be with them. Father, we pray this morning for those who are effectively speaking and living your gospel so that others are being called to you. Help us to be a part of what they are doing. Give us the boldness that comes from your Holy Spirit. May we be united in the proclamation that you so love the world that you gave your only Son. Grant us the wisdom of living lives of truth that we may powerfully declare that truth. Our Father, we pray for your forgiveness that you would guard us from the evil one. We pray, Father, that you will be merciful while we are in this world and keep us from being entangled in the part that rejects you. We pray all these things in the name of your Son and our Savior who gave his life that we might live. Amen. Well, we come to a brief review of the previous lesson, which was a focus on the conclusion of Jesus' final time of teaching and encouraging, what uh, some would call the farewell discourse or discourses that you find in John 13, 14, 15, and 16. And if you sort of look at all of that topically, the final topic is, which is some of uh, 15 and into 16, but it's, it's a time that Jesus chose to speak about persecution, about grief, and about joy and peace. And uh, some key phrases or sentences out of that would be these if the world hates you, know that it hated me before you. Thus, there will be time of persecution. You will no longer see me. You will weep and lament. Thus, there will be a time of grief. And your hearts will rejoice. And he uses the imagery of, uh, uh, of a woman going into labor would be a hard and, 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 and difficult time, but after the baby is born, there is a time of joy, and all of a sudden you forget some of the hard time that, that got you there out of the joy of, of new life. And Jesus uses that kind of illustration. As a brother said, it's an apt illustration, and of course Jesus would choose uh, the very best ones. And uh, then at the very end of this, he repeats a promise that he had given them earlier when he said, I have said these things to you that in me you may have peace. And so it is that though trouble is swirling around us, though hard times may be experienced, we have the opportunity in Christ to know peace even in such times. And then overall, Jesus spoke all of those things to help or to, to keep them from falling away. 
He knows that, that his mission, it is a very critical point, and the critical point is that he must depart in order for the mission to continue. What is going to happen next must happen, and it uh, is time for that to happen. He will be crucified and resurrected, and then for the mission to continue, which is his intent, all along, these brothers must be kept faithful. And I expect we could also understand this in view of the larger group of disciples who are not present to hear these words, but certainly these disciples, these 11, would share the words with them in the days ahead. And uh, they would use this to encourage one another to keep from falling away. Now we come to a time of prayer. It's really appropriate. And uh, sort of the flow of this, it could have been that some of the last things that Jesus was saying was, would be almost as they're on their way and then on their way to a garden. And we'll get to that garden at the beginning of chapter 18. But here is a prayer that the Lord prayed on the way to to the garden. It is the Lord's Prayer, but not the one that He taught us. It is the one that He prayed for Himself, that He prayed for those with Him, and as we will discover, a prayer that He prays for us. It's not the one that He prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane, though there are some similarities to it, but it looks like if you put what John tells us here and then gather together after that uh, what the Synoptic Gospels teach about what happens in the Garden of Gethsemane. So this is an intense time of prayer. And we shouldn't be surprised that at this point in time, Jesus is praying every step of the way. And so though it is not, the prayer that we're going to hear in the Synoptic Gospels in the Garden of Gethsemane, it is a prayer from the same heart with some of the similar concerns that he has in that prayer. It is a prayer that you'll find has several titles. A prayer of consecration. Consecrating or sanctifying those disciples is uh, an important part of this prayer. Or it is the prayer of the departing Redeemer. As he's already told us, I must go. I must go back to my Father. Or another way to say that is the farewell prayer. Or in a sense, it is a high priestly prayer in that as our high priest or their high priest, he brought them into the presence of God and was fully representing the uh, character of God and the concerns of God as he prayed even for himself. And so he does. The Lord prays for himself, and then he prays for his immediate followers, the 11 who are in prayer with him at the time. And then it will conclude with petitions for all of the believers who will follow. It's a prayer in which he knows that the betrayal, arrest, the trials, and the crucifixion are imminent. And thus, it is a time when one cannot not pray. Uh, it is uh, you do, he is a time of when, when you start pouring out your heart and your needs and your concerns to the Father. And so that's actually helpful for us because it teaches us how to pray and Jesus' example becomes a good example for us. And we're blessed by being able to, to be a part of this time of prayer in that we hear something of the fellowship between the Father and the Son. And we're invited into God's triune communion at this point. At this point, Jesus prays to his Abba. Of course, the Greek text of this gospel has the Greek word for Father, which is pater, first word of, the, of this prayer is pater, or father, but we also know that Jesus would have been praying in Arabic, and so he said, Abba, Abba, 
is the Hebrew Aramaic word for father. Jesus came into a Jewish world that had developed a very remote view of God, one that needed angels to carry all of the messages back and forth, a world that had so ceased to use the name of God, and of course they had a good, uh, let's say they had some legitimate concern for that, but nevertheless God is a bit more distant than certainly what Jesus reveals here as he brings his Father close by praying to him as Father, Abba. So let's listen and pray, so to speak, this prayer from John 17. When Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son that the Son may glorify you. Since you have given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. I have manifested your name to the people whom you gave me out of the world. Yours they were, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything that you have given me is from you. For I have given them the words that you gave me, and they have received them and have come to know in truth that I came from you, and they have believed that you sent me. I am praying for them. I am not praying for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. All mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. And I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world. And I am coming to you, Holy Father, keep them in your name, which you have given me, that they may be one, even as we are one. While I was with them, I kept them in your name, which you have given me. I have guarded them, and not one of them has been lost, except the son of destruction, that the scripture might be fulfilled. But now I am coming to you, and these things I speak in the world, that they may have joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their sake I consecrate myself, that they also may be sanctified in the truth. I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The world, uh, the glory that you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one, even as we are one. I in them, and you in me, that they may become perfectly one, so that the world may know that you have sent me, and love them, even as you loved me. Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me may be with me where I am, to see my glory that you have given me because you loved me before the foundation of the world. O oh, righteous Father, even though the world does not know you, I know you, and these know that you have sent me. I have made known to them your name, and I will continue to make it known that the love with which you have loved them may be in them and I in them. Let's go back to some key statements now. Uh, what Jesus prayed then really speaks to us now, and it teaches us about prayer now. One of the things we notice is that Jesus lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the Jewish posture of prayer was this. We will bow our heads, and it's our posture of prayer, and would... would uh, would express the same thing. 
That is respect from God. But the Jews prayed, hands lifted up. Uh, that's why Paul says in 1 Timothy chapter 2, lift up holy hands in prayer. And so that's the kind of prayer posture that Jesus used as he prayed to God. He's looking toward heaven. At this point, he's not looking into heaven. He's not having a vision of heaven. But he is looking toward heaven. And thus, their, their uh, worldview was he is looking toward his Father in heaven. The blessed were the eleven were blessed to hear this prayer, for they would later remember and actually learn even more as they reflected on it and as the Holy Spirit would bring it back to their uh, in their memory and in their understanding. But in a way, we also need to understand that that Jesus at this point is not teaching them or teaching us about prayer, though that sort of happens for us. What we also need to, at, at the, the very first look of this is that Jesus is praying. And that example may be the most valuable thing for us. Abba, we must learn to pray as Jesus prayed recognizing the intimacy that we can have with the Creator of all things, knowing that we can pray to Him as, as He taught us in another place, as our Father in heaven. And not only is there great intimacy there, there's also great responsibility there. For we are claiming in that uh, that we are part of God's family, and thus we should behave as God's children. And we must learn to pray to our Father in heaven. When we do, we recognize His, his authority. Uh, if we don't do that, then we are making ourselves the authority of our own lives, and we don't need to pray. But when we understand the meaning of addressing God as Father, then indeed we have a truly intimate connection with God. So one of the things that is working very much now in terms of Jesus being compelled to pray is the fact that he says the hour, or it could be translated equally as well, the time has come. You remember back in John chapter 2, that's the first introduction to this concept of hour or time as a specific time in the life of Jesus. And when Jesus was um, um, approached by his mother to provide some wine for a wedding that had run out of wine, his initial response was, my time hasn't come. He knew that launching the signs of who he was and what he was doing on the earth, all these signs that would point to God, would set in motion a sequence of events, or so to speak, a calendar that would conclude with what he's praying about now. My time has now come. And he prays that what happens here and how he behaves here will glorify God. And part of the meaning of glorify here is crucifixion. Now, ultimately, glorify is going to result in his resurrection and his ascension to the right hand of the Father. There is the place of the glorification of your Son. But, it, but at this point in time, the pathway to that right hand of the Father in heaven is through crucifixion and a lot of suffering, which when we get into chapters 18 and 19, we will be uh, eyewitnesses, so to speak, of that as well. And so the prayer is... Uh, Glorify your Son so that I may glorify you, so that 
I can reveal uh, the true glory of what you are doing through me on this earth so that ultimately there is real meaning in for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Now we come to uh, just highlighting uh, that the Son may glorify you. I've already spoken about now how He is going to be exalted and lifted up. But the point, uh, part I haven't mentioned yet is the fulfillment of Daniel 7, 13 through 14. There is uh, this prophecy or this vision prophetic vision that Daniel had that's recorded in Daniel 7 that is really part of, uh, though John doesn't mention that here, that this is part of what's going on here, the glorification of the Lord. Let's read Daniel 7, 13 through 14. I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man, and he came to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. The Lord Jesus, when he's praying this prayer, knows that that is at work in his life and what he's doing in terms of the glory that he's given the Father. And in turn, the glorification will return to him as the one who will have dominion and glory and a kingdom. And there would be several places then that we could go in the epistles that would uh, communicate the same thing. I think of, say, uh, Philippians 2, and there would be passages out of Colossians of the exaltation of Christ, certainly out of Ephesians as well. Glorified then. I want to pursue just a few comments here because Jesus also understands that he's that grain of wheat about which he spoke in John 12, 24. A grain of wheat that will fall into the earth and die and yet it will produce much fruit when after dying it comes back to life it is it, part of the meaning of glorified is being lifted up from the earth and we're told in that place 1232 that he said this by uh, as a way to express the kind of death he was going to die but we also know that he also says in that place, when I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all people to myself. And it all goes all, uh, back, all of this goes back, all the way back to John the baptizer seeing Jesus and, 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 and saying within the hearing of some of the people who were following him, behold the Lamb of God who takes the way, the sin of the world. And so this glorification is mutual. And perhaps uh, part of the value of sort of spending some time with this is that this should give us um, some, some, con some meditative content, let me say it that way, some content for our med meditation regarding uh, our... Uh, our own relationship with the Father. We want to live in a way that Jesus is living here, that he is glorifying his Father. And yet, at the end of all things, God will lift us up also in a way that uh, I, I'm not saying that we, we deserve any glory, or, but God is going, to, is going to honor his promises to us. And I guess, in a sense, uh, we will know something about the glory that we have yet to experience in the days ahead as we come into the presence of God, or maybe I should say in the time ahead. Uh, when we come into the presence of God, 
knowing the defeat of death that will occur in Jesus' resurrection, completing his work. And all of this, sort of from this point of the prayer, looking forward all the way until Jesus comes again. When you gather all of that together in terms of what God is doing, has done, will do, then it will bring glory unto God. Because when you get to uh, the scenes of heaven, all of the attention, all of the praise is, on, is to the one who is on the throne and the lamb who is beside him there. But you, that, that, that's, that's kind of what is being prayed about here is we, we, we have to think of this in terms of how that shapes how we see where we are going as, as God's people. Jesus is also praying in this for strength to obey. His obedient submission to everything that is going to happen in the next uh, hours into what? Well, about 24 to maybe 30 hours. I don't know. I have to kind of work that out for sure. But his obedient submission is necessary for the victory that will follow. And uh, the proof is in the testing. Uh, he is this. We think about uh, the time when Jesus, after he was baptized, was led into the wilderness by the Spirit to be tested by uh, by the devil. And that's not the only time Jesus was ever tested by the devil. I would say here is a time of testing as well. Maybe the greatest time of testing, though the language is not used. The reality is there. For the question at hand is, will he avoid the cross? And one of the things that we'll see in the lesson to follow is, is the brutality and, and uh, pain and suffering that Jesus uh, is going to experience and does experience. So that when you look back to John 12, 27, he said, now my soul is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? Is that what I should pray? Well, from the synoptics, he, he does ask God if it's possible, but if not, your will be done. Not my will, but your will be done. And Jesus ultimately knew the answer to that. And here in this place, he's kind of, praying in view of, of, of all that, that the prayer of save me. Well, we can bring anything in prayer before God, but Jesus also in that place said, I'm not, I understand, and for this purpose I have come through this hour. Like, I, as I mentioned, if possible, take this cup from me, but not my will, but yours be done. And so essentially, he is praying for the strength to obey, which I would say we, we ought to tuck that into a pocket of our mind because there can come times of great stress in our lives so that we need to be able, or we need to remember to pray to God for the strength to be obedient in those times that we would not fall away from him in any kind of way. Well, let's move along. Since you have given him authority over all flesh. And so this actually would go back to the fulfillment of the Daniel 7 prophecy of the Son of Man who was to be given dominion and glory and a kingdom. Or this is uh, the kind of affirmation that we're going to hear at the end of the Gospel of Matthew all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. And we notice that Jesus has authority over all flesh. But we also know that, uh, and, and perhaps a picture of that authority over all flesh can be found in Matthew 25. When, uh, sort of a parable, but in a sense it's more of just a description 
of what will come at the end of all things when the Son of Man comes in His glory and all the angels with Him, then He will sit on His glorious throne. Before Him will be gathered all nations. And so that is certainly ultimate authority that Jesus has over all flesh, over all nations. Well, we also recognize here that Jesus also has the authority to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And ultimately, where, where I would come out with this is he is speaking about those who believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Not all flesh, even in the gospel, not all flesh turned to him. He came to his own, but his own did not receive him. But there were those who believed in him, who believed that he was the Christ, the Son of the living God. And so it says in 524, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. And that would figure back into the scene of judgment that you find in John 20, I'm sorry, Matthew 25 in the separation of the sheep from the goats. And he is really praying um, in, in terms of to all you have given him. He is speaking about, as he will say later in this text, in this prayer, those who have kept from uh, those who have kept your word. And this is eternal life that they may know you. This is kind of a one of those statements that stands up off the page is almost gives us an opportunity to understand uh, what it we think of of eternal life more in terms of quantity but here there's really a focus on the quality of eternal life the quality or eternal life is the life of knowing God the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you sin. And so the meaning is something like it's God's life or the kind of life God has. It is new age, the life of the new age. I shouldn't say new age life because new age has a loaded meaning in our culture, but it's the life of the age to come, so to speak, in terms of speaking in scripture. Uh, or you could also say it's resurrection life. And again, it's certainly there is quantity there because God is the one who is, was, and ever shall be. Uh, God is eternal. And so we have God, if we have God's life, there's a lot of quantity to that as you think in a human way. But it's also very much about knowing God, knowing God uh, in the sense of a real personal relationship with God, not just knowing facts about God, but knowing God in the sense of a personal relationship with Him. And this brings us back to Jesus who came to earth to make His Father known and to make a way for us to have a relationship with God much more than any other creatures or, or, or any other part of His creation. So, and I think maybe a good way to see that would be to think about the kind of relationship Adam and Eve had with God in the garden before their sin, before they were uh, ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Before that, there's a hint that says they walked with God in the garden in the cool of the day. That kind of, of uh, uh, you let's say, father-child relationship so that we sit down and spend time with God. I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. Now glorify me in your presence. How We notice here how that, that little theme here at the first part of the prayer is really the focus of Jesus. He wants this to truly honor God. And uh, so I've glorified you. Stay with me. 
let your presence be, be with me so that we can eventually bring all of this back in renewal to the kind of uh, relationship that we had before the world existed. And the good news is that uh, that which Jesus is seeking here for himself, we're ultimately, or even, even before now, we're invited into that kind of relationship. His work was to reveal the Father, to redeem mankind, and to demonstrate his true, and to demonstrate for us true humanity. That would be part of the meaning of the work that you gave me to do. And I think uh, this comment that I actually I gathered out of uh, uh, Bob Utley's commentary on John is really helpful because um, we probably think more in terms of our redemption. That is, that the only thing Jesus uh, was sent to do was to die for our sins that uh, we might have an opportunity to go to heaven. Well, there's a bit more to it than that. He reveals to us God and thus invites us into a relationship with God. That's now. That really affects our lives now. And his demonstration of what true human living looks like, ought to be, is probably the way you have to say it for us. His demonstration of true humanity, that kind of picture of what it means to really live, is something that speaks to us right now. We look to the Lord for how we are to take the next steps in our lives. I am praying for them. Now he is going to, no longer praying for himself, but he's praying for this group of disciples gathered around him. And I think, as I mentioned earlier, to some extent the larger group of, of disciples who he knew were following him at the time. Well, this prayer of the Lord can be divided into three parts, and here is then the entry into the second part. This whole prayer of John 17 can be seen in three parts. And now we're going to pray for the 11. Uh, this part of the prayer is going to kind of reach back and get some of the points that Jesus had given to the disciples in 14 through 16. Uh, their belief that he had come from God, their, the promise that he gave them in 1624 of complete joy, also regarding the coming hate of the world. And those are the kinds of things that he prays about uh, at, at this time. And I think here we have an expression that fits, I mean, a, a demonstration that fits the expression that we heard at the beginning of John 13, and that is, he loved them and loved them to the very end. And so now, uh, the Lord is praying for them as a part of his expression, as a part of the expression of his love for them. He is praying for them, and truthfully, that will not cease from this time forward. Uh, he will continue praying for them, for he is our mediator and our advocate, our advocate. 1 John 2, 1 and 2. As is the Father, so as is the Spirit, so is the, is the Son of God. As he said, as John will write in John 2, 1, 1 John 2, 1, My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. That's the same word used to describe the Spirit in uh, John 15, 14, 15, and 16 as well, when it's translated in the ESV as helper, or it could be advocate. And so what amazes me here is that all three persons are seeking our redemption. What Jesus is doing, the Father has done, is doing, will do, and the Spirit as well. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought, 
but the Spirit himself intercedes for us. And so uh, it, it is a, all, all of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, is, is there to bring our salvation. Then I am praying for them as I have been glorified in them. So uh, just as he has given glory to the Father, by doing what the Father had called him to do, now you have the, uh, the, the disciples have brought glory to him because of their, uh, their faith in him, because they have followed him. And we know that, that uh, indeed uh, there's some tough times ahead without a doubt. And yet, ultimately, they will lift up the Lord. And uh, I would say the best place to see that start happening is going to be on the day of Pentecost when they lift up the Lord Jesus Christ and proclaim him as both Lord and Messiah. And uh, so I am glorified in them. I will be glorified in them. And, and that's critical. Because I'm no longer in the world, and they're still here, and uh, they will can they will do what I have uh, called them to do, and trained them to do, prepared them to do. Uh, so part of part of what's in the heart of Jesus here is praying for this transition uh, to go well. It is a significant, critical transition. So Holy Father, keep them in your name. The name of God in the Old Testament is spoken of as a place where we are protected or kept safe. And so Jesus is asking for the strong, protecting power of the name of God to preserve and keep the disciples safe while they are in the world. You could go to Psalm 54, Psalm 20, Proverbs 18. Psalm 54, 1 says, O God, save me by your name and vindicate me by your uh, your might psalm 21 may the name of god of the, of the god of jacob uh, protect you and so that's what uh, when you kind of hear just god take care of them that they may be one even as we are one and here's a theme that is initiated that's really important to the lord and that is the unity of the disciples. These things I speak in the world that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. And one of the things that's kind of at work now is he is setting them apart. Uh, even in speaking of a joy that is going to come from him fulfilled in them, this is the sort of thing, uh, the joy in the Lord that can only come from God but it will set them apart from the world around them. Uh, here's another reason why God must keep them, because uh, they're going to be hated just like the world hated me, but keep them, God, safe in that time and keep them from the evil one. In other words, set them apart. Make them holy unto your purposes. And that's really the, the meaning of the concept of holiness is to set apart for the service of God. And that's what he's asking for here for them. And so, again, there, here's the transition. You sent me into the world. I've done what you called me to do. Now I'm sending them into the world. And just as I've dedicated myself or consecrated myself to your service and will continue to do so, also, may that be true in them. I do not ask for these. And so here we shift into Jesus' prayer for us. I do not ask for these only, but also for those who believe through me. And essentially, he has one request, that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me. This is the highest bar of, of unity or the test of unity ever the unity of the Father, Son, and Spirit. And yet, this is what Jesus lifts us up to a high place. And I can only... I, we, 
as we as we hear this in a heart that is really praying to God, how uh, we probably should weep at this point because we haven't done very well in unity. We haven't done well at all. But Jesus prays that we would be united and we get to this point. Well, I need to go to this point. I and them and you and me, that they may be perfectly one so that the world may know that you sent me and love them even as you love me. In other words, our unity is part of our witness as to who Jesus is, that he was sent from God, and that God loves us all. And, and uh, honestly, uh, this is a huge challenge at this point. And maybe that's why, as I get to the conclusion of the lesson, can we learn to pray like Jesus prayed? Will these be the kinds of things that are important? Praying our own needs to God, but praying for others as well. And praying for those yet to come. Those in the next generation that we don't even know yet, but the next generation of believers. Will we learn to pray this kind of prayer? What follows is now going to be uh, Jesus' arrest and trial, the betrayal arrest, denial, and trials. John 18, 1 through 19, 16 will be the focus and the lesson to follow. And uh, I pray that you'll read ahead. Uh, and, I, and yet, hang on to John 17 for what it teaches us about prayer. Thank you for being here so much. The grace of the, the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all. God bless.